Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, Season 5, Episode 9. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Charlebois. Our special guest this week bringing us exclusive, proprietary, never heard before, nobody else has it, data from Cattle and thousands, thousands of Canadian consumers. Colleen Martin is joining us here from Cattle. We're talking about sustainability and as we always do, you and I, Sylvain, we want to ask questions in a way that other people perhaps are not or questions that we have. And in this case, I don't want to call it a going in assumption, but one of the assumptions we had is everybody lies. Mm. So in other words, <laughs> when, you when we say... You don't lie to Revenue Canada, do you? <laughs> never. 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 <laughs> uh, what we assumed is that we wanted to know... You know, when you talk about sustainability and making choices, does it really drive the choices in food and the choices you are making? And to what degree, actually, it matters the state of the economy? Does that matter less or more? And what percentage of Canadians are making decisions based on sustainability claims or interest in? So I thought, I, anyway, some great results. And, and uh, what would you think? Yep. I think? I think it was a great session. No, I think it was. Uh, of course, uh, as a researcher, I'm always concerned about uh, um, survey honesty and yeah. uh, how how honest uh, respondents are. I mean, maybe it's hard hard to get to. I mean, surveys are are really a picture in time, and 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 that's why we actually created the index is that to basically see that right, picture right. evolve over time. And so, uh, but I but I thought that questions were were. Well designed to to get to uh, the clocks of the matter because uh, we can talk about you know mother and apple pie organics local yep. who's who's against local like seriously well who's against sustainability I mean there it's yeah. funny actually we we'll get to it in the in the interest but there's a hardcore group of people who say I really don't even talk think act about sustainability at all but you know who's going to say it's kind of like do you like puppies I mean it's it's you know yeah, exactly. You think, do you think you should make, you know, and that also depends on how the question is phrased. Do you think I should be making decisions that will save the planet? Nah. Like, nah. we tried to get it. I mean, I think I, we're, we're both alike. Follow the money. Money never lies. And how do you design a survey in order to understand where the money is actually going? Not where people are saying it's going. All right. Well, we'll get we'll get to our uh, great session with Colleen and and that data uh, after the news. I want to start the news with the reaction, post reaction to your milk dumping study uh, that was released. Oh yeah, last week. I want to start there yep. because it seems it seems I saw a bunch of reactions as as we could all imagine. You know, it seems like the dairy folks say those numbers are made up. Uh, that's not the real number, but I'm not prepared to actually give you any real number. And by the way, maybe we don't even collect those numbers, but I'm still not willing. I still don't they like didn't your say numbers. That. They, didn't, they didn't admit that they're not collecting numbers. Mm. They didn't admit it. My guess is that they're not. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, it was a bit rich on their part to dispute the data that we published in a peer-reviewed journal, by the way, an academic journal, uh, blind reviewed in one of the top journals in the world, but that's not important to them. And of course, when you dispute numbers, it'd be fun to actually see what your numbers look like so we can actually have a debate, but nothing came out. Nothing came out. I mean, they, they absolutely, it was pretty clear from the get go. They wanted to kill the news as quickly as sure. possible. Sure, sure. As quickly as possible. They didn't want to debate. They didn't want anything because, they just don't want to talk about it. It's a taboo subject. But here's the thing. There are more reports coming out. Uh, a processor, I don't know if you actually saw that this morning, but on X, there's a hmm. anonymous food processor out of Quebec admitting that he's aware, I assume that he's a man, he's a man CEO of a dairy processor in Quebec. And I don't know who that is, but he did claim that milk dumping is a problem. He very well knows this, and he believes that at least 200 million liters of milk is dumped every year in Canada. But he didn't actually specify as to how he, he came up with that number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but I mean, more and more people who actually have the guts uh, are coming out saying, you know what, this is a problem. 
Okay. And we have the perfect system to solve the problem, which is supply management. Now, I want to follow up on one thing. Uh, one of the comments back to you on social media was that the Quebec process for handling excess is different than Ontario or other provinces. Is, is that is that is that your understanding and is that taken into the model like they basically said listen we handle it differently and it's not that bad here but again no didn't didn't get into the details any, well, any so the, provincial the, the differences about, in these things what i regret about last week is that the news came out the study was released but i was actually pretty much not available for comments at all i was actually now, relying you were in Saskatchewan, on right yeah. yeah, I was, and, and traveling to Saskatchewan, you lose a couple of days, uh, you're in the air. And so yeah. in the meantime, of course, in Quebec, the union, and don't, don't, I mean, that UPA union is very well, organized. they have 1100 employees. So they have a lot of resources to deal with media requests. And as I was getting requests, well, I didn't respond, so they went to the union, and that's what they got a lot of airplay, and mm-hmm. they got a lot of their arguments out without really reading the study. I can tell you, some of the comments that were made, yeah, it was clear. <laughs> didn't read the study, clear, crystal clear. It was like I, I, I don't think she they, they read the study because she was talking about me. Yeah, and I'm I'm third author. I'm not second or even first. I'm third author. I didn't now, do in, the now in your world. Thing. What is third? Hold on a sec. What does third author mean in a peer Third author paper? is 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 the one that uh, has contributed the least to a study, and uh, the 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 legwork, the heavy lifting was done by both Thomas Elliott, who's in Denmark, and uh, Ben uh, Goldstein, who's at the University of Michigan, but both don't speak French, first of all. And secondly, they're not really keen in giving media interviews. And Thomas, who is really the one that did all the work, is in Europe, six hours ahead of us. And so mm. it was really, Interesting. it just didn't work out. And mm. But they did win the PR war and because it's, I mean, they're Goliath, right? Or David, they're Goliath. Well, maybe, maybe they won the PR battle because you, I saw a, a, an op-ed in uh, the Globe and Mail, pretty big newspaper, that uh, more fell towards your line of thinking. That was out this week. Well, there, in, in English Canada, what's really interesting, I, I thought, is that in English Canada, I think we won the PR game. In Quebec, I don't think we did. Uh, mm. But to me, because in Quebec, it's, I mean, half, far, half of the dairy farms are there and everything is very political and nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to mm. endorse anything. Uh, I posted uh, this week that I'll be at Senate next week. Uh, for Bill C-282, which would grant immunity to supply management, uh, post something on LinkedIn. No one from yet will either like or post comments. I can tell you, Michael, it's an mm. untouchable topic, so they're very careful. I'm a little, but, baffled. Uh, I, I'm a little baffled about that, Bill, because it, it's not like, like country to country. So we'll talk about New Zealand in a, in a couple of minutes who've escalated their, their dairy disagreement. But it's not like, the, you know, America says to Canada, we want to talk about dairy. And we're like, oh, well, sorry, there's a bill. I'm not allowed to talk to you about it. Well, we're going to talk about it anyway, my friends. <laughs> like, I'm a little baffled by that. The, the, the mechanics of that bill actually in a trade negotiation is, are you baffled or how do you think that's going to work? Well, I mean, it basically is, is just a signal. Uh, for example, I mean, right now, uh, most universities uh, can't get international students uh, in classrooms because of of visa restrictions. And I can tell you in China and different parts of the world, the signal that it sends is that Canada is not welcoming anyone from outside. Bill 282, in my view, would send that exact signal. It would basically tell to the world, you know, we're not open for business, so why bother even knocking on your door? That's the danger here, okay? It's not mm-hmm. about going to the table and put everything on a table. You're not even going to get to the table. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's what Bill C-282 would do. I'm more worried about the collateral damage of a bill like that. You you know, not unlike when we saw, we we talked about in the pod, you know, the, there's a hundred percent tariff on Chinese electric vehicles. Okay. Well, I'm coming after canola then says China. Like it feels like the tit for tat would be anyway. Be net harmful to us. No, well, the, the, no, the, the scope, the scope of this, it's not punitive at all. It's just, it's about future trade agreements. Okay, and of course, we have uh, a, an election in the U.S. 
And if, uh, if Trump wins, we're opening up uh, the United States, uh, Mexico, Canada deal. And if Bill C-282 is a law by that time, uh, my guess is that Washington will start actually hammering out some some restrictions there, which is not which is not something we want. Right. So tit, tit for basic, tat retaliation, right? Trade retaliation and, versus and trade. To me, when you negotiate with another country, it's quite normal to start things off by saying, "Well, these are some of the things that I want that I want to do with you." And sure. every time we put supply management on the table, this actually actually endorses that practice by parliament and it is law. And so you can't really, negotiators would never have a mandate to do anything with supply management at all, which is really a dangerous thing to do for the entire economy. We're not talking about just food here. We're Mm -hmm. not just talking about grains or beef or pork. It's everything. Just for a handful of farmers, it's just ridiculous. It's the most, it's, it's, it's an awful idea to do what they're doing because no economic sectors deserves that kind of attention. No one. Let's talk, let's talk about New Zealand. So um, Trade Minister Todd McClay from New Zealand said his government yes. notified Canadian government and other members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we're in a big trade agreement. That yep. uh, They've triggered a mandatory negotiations, and that must begin within 15 days, i.e. we're tired of waiting on you, Canada. That's we right. got to get going on this. What's the problem here? Well, we're dragging our feet, and uh, it's, it's all about imports and, and market access for their product. And so they want access to our, our – our, but, but, but in Canada, we're just we're, – we're disorganized by design. And so whether it's with the U.S., whether it's with Europe, uh, we, don't, we don't want foreign products. We just we, – we, we make it very complicated for, for import quotas – uh, sometimes we grant them, sometimes we don't, and uh, and and New Zealand is 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 very is a very savvy country. Understands very trade focus, not trade reliant. It's trade focus. Unlike Canada, we're just we're just, we just trade because we we offer cheap commodity to the rest of the world, mm-hmm. and so New Zealand actually sees what we're doing and i think it is right to challenge us in courts and and who is uh, the courts like which court like i guess it's an adjudication process built within, yeah, within the trans pacific partnership right that's right exactly and so so who who knows who's going to win but uh, my my guess is that you know the the, the thing about dairy in particular because dairy's 80% of supply management is that they have a lot of resources they have they have more lawyers than the pmo I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so that's why they can carry on and do all sorts of things and, uh, and, and get away with it. And, I, and, I, and I'm hoping, you know, Canadian agriculture always accepted what supply management wanted until now. 282 is creating that division, hmm. saying you're going too far now. You're going too far. So we've accepted compensations we, we saw Ag Canada give $5 billion in compensation because of these treaties, basically inflating uh, farmland values everywhere. You see pickup trucks, brand new pickup trucks everywhere. I mean, it just basically made farmland more expensive because it's an overcapitalized sector. That's what mm-hmm. dairy is. It's overcapitalized. So an overcapitalized sector makes makes the lives of other sectors miserable <laughs> and they hate it, but they can't speak up. They can't speak up because they're farmers, right? They're polite and friendly and nice to each other. But 282, man, I got to tell you, with 282, what I'm hearing from grain farmers, beef, hogs, you're going too far, buddy. Well, let's uh, let's leave the dairy segment alone. We've uh, we've spent enough time on dairy, but let's stay in the bovine world. Uh, you yes. put out uh, an op-ed, and you did some research and uh, looked at some data around uh, the cattle industry. Oh my and god! And your net conclusion was, if I paraphrase, is that uh, if you think cattle or beef price, if you enjoy a steak, is Where high today. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? It's going up, <laughs> not down, right? 
Where's the beef? It's going up, not down. Like there's a, there's not enough cattle, and b, the prices are going to keep going up. And but what I'm interested in, that's interesting. But what I'm interested in, doesn't the market adjust? Everybody goes, well, if people want to consume more beef, I should raise more cattle, or is it just? It's a long process, right? So talk about your your findings. Well, I mean, in typically the, the thing about cattle futures, if prices go up, people are interested in investing. That's how it works, right? Right. But not this time. Not Why this not? time. After what's going on? After mad cow, after droughts. So basically, for the last couple of years, it's costing cattle ranchers more money to feed cattle. Okay? okay. Because of droughts. So they've been selling off. They were selling off and off and off, and prices really start to go up. And then, well, the average age of ranchers is pretty up there. It's over 60. And so they were saying, okay, well, money's great. Why not? Why not sell off and leave? And both in Canada and the United States, a lot of cattle ranchers are leaving the industry, which makes the herd much smaller. So in Canada right now, hmm. our herd size is at the same is the same as in 1987. Wow. When we had 26 million people in the country. In the U.S., it's even worse. Their, their herd size is at the same level as in 1951. Wow. And, and, and there's and, no product. And now does this mean uh, two things? One, does this mean that, you know, if you believe in some kind of economic theories that the level, the market will will clear, the market will level, and people go, wow, this looks like a good business to get into. I'm getting into this well, that's, business. Well, that's the que- that's the million-dollar question mm-hmm. right now. When is it going to break? Maybe some dairy farmers to turn their minds to cattle or something. Well, of course, and dairy farmers, they actually get into the beef game or the meat game because of their dairy cows, right? And they're getting more for their cows. Uh, absolutely. And so – so the, the, the big question is, when will it break? When will cattle ranchers start to build up the herd again, right? To actually have more, more cattle. But the thing is, Michael, is that in, it takes a long time year, to rebuild right? a herd. Year. It's not like yeah, hogs yeah. or chicken. It takes two years. So that's why I'm pretty, pretty positive that in 2025, beef prices – Will uh, will not drop. It it will go up unless people are into Mexican beef. Well, I was going to say uh, we've talked about on this show the Mexican yeah. ungraded, which doesn't mean unsafe by any means. Let's be clear no. on that. But Mexican ungraded beef on Canadian. Have you, ha- have you had Mexican ungraded beef yet? I've not. I've I not. have. I've tried it. It's it's just. It's not the same thing. It's good for so stews, the, maybe? Is it good, better for stews well, than well, on yeah, steak? It's, it's on good for plate? stews, absolutely. And, but it's, bar, it's not barbecue material. Hmm. It's we certainly could, could, not we could last turn to barbecue. Like, and it's, it's, not, it's certainly not last barbecue material for sure. <laughs> well, we, uh, anyway, that's, it's so interesting. Um, and I guess, you know, I, is this a global phenomenon? Could we turn to Argentina? Could we turn to other places in South America to, to get beyond Mexico? No, it's, it's basically North herbs. America, but we mostly eat North American beef, right? And so, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm a bit concerned. And and frankly, the biggest part of this that I'm concerned about is: are we gonna are we gonna see beef price itself out of the market? I mean, are mm-hmm. people gonna just go and leave the category and never come back? But the the, the trifecta always adjusts, as you taught me, right? It's beef, chicken, pork. They're like yep. beef's high, more chicken, cattle, cows, but pork hogs. is up too for the same reason. Mm-hmm. But pork can actually adapt, and uh, it will take. Yeah, sure. exactly. It'll take. It'll take a few months. It, it could go down eventually. Uh, chicken is supply managed in Canada, as you know, and uh, so it prices rarely go down. They rarely go down. It's as steady as she goes. So a piece of meat, mm-hmm. and who knows? But it's uh, it's it's really concerning. And and ground beef is really the go to item at the meat counter when you're when you're looking at bovine proteins but cheap bovine proteins and it's up 19 percent in the last six months well let's connect this uh, price of beef with uh, with some of the restaurants so let's talk about uh, mcdonald's and two we've talked about before yes. that uh, you know their average cost is going up obviously cost of beef is going up but now they have a different problem there's an e coli break uh, outbreak yeah. uh, now they've you know, very professional organization. I guess it was in. It's it, it's surprising to me how very specific. It's specific geographically and to quarter yeah. pounders. Yeah. And uh, early days, I think we've lost one person and and uh, 
10 people or more have been injured in the U.S. only. And I, I hear it has something to do maybe even with the onions. Now, they're all yeah. not selling anymore. 29 cases but. between September, September and October. Uh, one casualty, unfortunately, mm-hmm. all in the U.S. Uh, mm-hmm. McDonald's Canada actually today issued a statement saying that uh, this is – this is not going to impact. Or this is not impacting Canada. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I actually thought that Canada, uh, McDonald's Canada, was uh, wasn't in front of this one. Actually, I thought they did a very good job mm-hmm. working with the CDC. The CDC was actually quite transparent in terms of the casualty. The person actually had some mm-hmm. uh, some uh, some uh, health issues even before uh, the person actually went to McDonald's. So very transparent. Lots of information. I mean, the, the thing about McDonald's is that. It's massive. It's an indicator. It's part of the Dow Jones. I mean, it's just yeah, you, yeah. you can't mess around. And some people on media, on social media, were saying, "Oh well, Donald Trump was actually there a couple of days ago." Yeah, so that was my see. my first my first thought when I heard this is some of that orange makeup got into some burgers or something, <laughs> and and it created some E. coli. Like uh, that was my first instinct when I heard this. I said, "Oh, let's coordinate this." Where where Trump was, and and maybe uh, you know we can tie it all back. To- but I, I quickly I posted this more. Listen, y- you can't mess around with public health. Uh, there's a casualty. It's an outbreak. Yeah, uh, it is serious. it's it, there's no conspiracy theorists. Please come on, let's stop this. Okay, this is this is serious stuff. You're yep. not going to politicize an outbreak. You shouldn't be. We should never politicize. And this morning, actually, I was listening to a Yale professor. Uh, talking about this recall, and he was saying, well, there are more recalls because we have fewer inspectors out there hired by the FDA under Biden. So the politicization of the outbreak with Donald's actually went both ways, and Mm. I think it's disgusting. I mean, just stop, please. Mm. Seriously. All right. Well, uh, let's hope that that, uh, there's less – I think, you know, McDonald's great organization they'll get they'll get oh, a handle on this and then they also and, by and the frankly, way i think they did a good job and it's an example for for other outlets uh, i think chipotle if you remember a few years ago we talked about it on the show yeah, that yeah. outbreak was badly yeah let's hope it's badly not managed yeah well and and, and uh, you know in all seriousness i think mcdonald's did a very good job managing the trump appearance he said listen we're not political it's just he went and visited a franchise and by the way Kamala's work there too, but we don't know because we don't keep records that far. Anyway, so I thought they did a very good job. Did they're... she? Did she work the, at McDonald's? Well, she said she's worked at McDonald's, and somebody, of course, said prove it. And then, like the franchisee said, "Well, I don't keep records that far back." Like, I don't. Did she work at McDonald's in Montreal? Uh, n- I don't think so. No, I don't think so. But uh, no. I don't know all the details. But I know that. How like, was she else. in Montreal when she grew up there? I think she was in her teens, right? She was probably old Could enough to work. Could have been. Could have been. Um, Can you imagine the next president of the United States she would have worked at McDonald's in two countries? I said that would be nice. It'll, it'll, it'll be something. That'll be something for McDonald's. Win, lose, or, win, lose, or draw, I'm afraid. Um, oh, did anyway. you see? A, I mean, the, the, the American election needs to happen very soon because right now markets are going crazy. crazy. Farmers are selling soybeans ahead of the election, just in case Trump comes in as president because of tariffs, potential tariffs against America coming from yeah. China. So there's a, there's a markets are already being impacted right now. Should Trump win, we need this election to happen as soon as possible. Well, let's stick on elections just for a quick sec before we get to our interview with Colleen and the great research on uh, sustainability. So we have two uh, provincial elections in the country. So in New Brunswick. Uh, yep. And then we have something going on in BC. I keep asking who's the premier there, and the answer is not Flip quite clear. Flip a coin. Any thoughts on uh, the Liberals in uh, in New Brunswick? Uh, of course, as it pertains to ag, and any thoughts on uh, BC? I, I and the think other side? I think the Susan Holt government won, and she happens to be a liberal. <laughs> I mean, if you, I mean, New Brunswick is right next door. I think the right party won. The right, I would say, the right coalition won. If you look at all the people that actually ran under the liberal banner, uh, many of them are former conservatives. So, and any much- any of any of them have a affiliation with AG? Like again, we're not a political podcast. So, any any thoughts on the? Uh, I I don't know, but I mean, community? no. New Brunswick really has some serious issues when it comes to food security and agriculture. Uh, their agricultural sector is not very strong, and I'm hoping, and I'm and food security was a big issue for Susan Holt. Uh, I think 
as premier, she, re- she will focus very much on making sure that New Brunswickers are taken care of and that food autonomy becomes a great, greater issue for sure. As far as BC goes, I, I must say, I mean, it's, it's, a, diffi- it's a difficult situation. Uh, I was actually talking, I was in a meeting yesterday with uh, my UBC um, friends uh, because we were working on Canada food price, for, for, food price report for December. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a miserable place right now because nobody knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I did, uh, sticking with provincial, again, I saw that there was an agreement finally. You know, one of the things you and I talked about is interprovincial barriers just being such nonsense and a drag on productivity. And, yeah. and it seems like the Fed, federal government can't get people together in a room, but it looks like Alberta and BC did because it looks like now the Okanagan and the fine wines created in the Okanagan can yeah. get shipped to Alberta. That's a great, that's great news, right? Well, the, I mean, I lived in the prairies, and there is there's a lot of collaboration between uh, the prairie provinces and, to a certain extent, BC. Uh, frankly, I, I must I must say, Ontario and Quebec are problems typically when it comes to working together, and the Atlantic is really left uh, remotely isolated. Uh, essentially so and, and premiers here in the region uh, do work together but we're not mm-hmm. big i mean we're very small well you, you win to the degree you speak as the atlantic provinces right because together you you represent um and there's probably going to be an election in, new, in nova scotia within the next i'd say two weeks okay interesting yep. interesting there you all go. right we'll keep there's we'll a scoop keep, we'll keep because we'll our, our, our sales tax just dropped today well, as of oh, April first, two thousand. I saw. 1st, I saw. So, so this is the that first means, time right. in a long time in Canada I've seen yeah. taxes being lowered. What yeah. a novel concept for Canadians! <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that information. I don't know what to do. How, how can we complain? We need to complain about lowering taxes as <laughs> oh, soon as we'll possible. Find, oh, we'll find something to complain about anyway. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's take a break now and let's get to this uh, great interview with Colleen and uh, Colleen Martin from Cattle talking about our sustainability research. Well, we welcome back Colleen Martin from Cattle once again to talk to us about uh, more data they've collected. Colleen, welcome back. Hello, hello. So this week's topic is about sustainability, but uh, we we have we have talked, we have discussed uh, sustainability over the last several years, Michael and I, and we've always wondered, you know, what's the real market currency around sustainability? Are we, are people willing to pay for sustainability? And and you guys really were gracious enough to go back to feel and ask thousands of Canadians what they thought about sustainability and uh, if it's worth anything to them. So uh, could you walk us through uh, the methodology you use to understand what Canadians are thinking about when it comes to sustainability and food? Absolutely. In fact, we asked 8,930 folks last week these very questions that we'll discuss. And one of the things that we did differently about this study is that we upfront kind of reminded everybody that we're really interested in their honest feedback because we know that there is a little bit of a gap between what people say they want to do and versus what they actually do in those moments because we know price is such an issue right now um, when, when assessing that grocery bill. So we asked them a series of questions regarding sustainability. First Mm -hmm. one being, how important is sustainability to you when choosing products? And overall, 55% of consumers considered sustainability to be either very important, which was 21%, or somewhat important, 31%, when choosing consumer packaged goods. Millennials and Gen Z are most likely to rate sustainability as very important, reflecting a generational shift towards eco-conscious consumption. Now, when we look at that from a demographic standpoint, urban consumers, 89%, show a higher prioritization of sustainability compared to rural, which was only 11%. And then uh, another obvious um, result was Quebec and Alberta exhibiting contrasting attitudes with Quebec having the highest share of consumers placing little importance on sustainability compared to Alberta's stronger sustainability focus that is, any any of these results surprised you, uh, Colleen? I don't think so. No. Um, not in this market. I think mm. had had like had this been pre COVID, had maybe a year or two mm. from now. Like it's really expensive. You know, I guess that's really the thing where you'd want to do this study over a couple of years because it's it's a it's clear that people are under pressure. 
Yeah. And it's also clear that under pressure, this becomes a, a less significant issue. Now, what's going on in Quebec? So, so Vance, stand up for your province there. Like, what, so, <laughs> you know, so the, the Quebecers have the highest share of consumers placing little importance on sustainability. So they care, if I say that differently, they care the least about sustainability. Have I got that right? Yes, it seems like that should be flipped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it's the term, right? Because uh, uh, I know in your survey, you do explore different concepts and perhaps it doesn't resonate all that well with uh, with with Quebecers. Who knows? I mean, I I, I do believe that in Quebec, there is a uh, an acute focus on the environment, uh, mm. but are they willing to pay for it? I guess perhaps Quebecers are more honest than other Canadians. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a super interesting point. Colleen, did you at the beginning of the survey, like we talked about this, um, I can't remember if it was offline or online, the three of us, but you know, how do we get people to answer this, I want to say honestly or straightforward, because everybody wants to support the environment. Well, not everybody, because it's pretty clear there's a bunch of people in every answer to every question said, absolutely not, I don't care. And in fact, they it felt like they were like rebelling against the whole thing. But Maybe we can talk about that later. But did did you do any pre, like in the in the survey in your format? Did you do any? Hey, listen, we we just really need you to answer what you actually will do versus what we think you want. You yes. to hear from you. You know, talk yeah, about. Yeah, we did bit. that right up front, reminding them that you know we really are looking for an honest answer here because we want to understand how we can improve, how we can do both things: managing mm-hmm. the household budget while making sure that we're you know, addressing the sustainability, yeah, yeah. sustainability issue. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these are realistic results I, I find, but again, it's, it's that cognitive dissonance. You know, when mm-hmm. you ask somebody, they want to be that person, but when faced with, you know, a budget, it's sure. really hard to sure. do that. And we saw that when we asked them their willingness to pay more for sustainability, mm-hmm. there's a, a tremendous amount of price sensitivity. Well, we, I guess we saw that when you asked them the opposite question: if they were, if sustainability price products were priced closer to non-sustainable options, yeah. whatever that is, almost sixty-one percent said, "Oh yeah, then I'd buy it." Exactly, right? and but, that is well, the big issue here. Yeah. It's the yeah. sensitivity yeah. to price. Yeah. I love, I love that eleven percent said no. <laughs> like, <laughs> and the generations make sense, right? Because this is not a problem of the yeah. boomer generation. Like they just don't. No, whatever. Yeah, whatever. You know. So, Val, what do you th- so Val, what do you think of that answer? Like, there's a consistently in every question, like um, a, a, a hardcore element. Like, how often do you choose a more sustainable option? Never, eighteen percent. Never. That like that's a very interesting response to me. It's like never. Yeah. I don't, I, I, like, I'll go out of my way not to be sustainable. <laughs> what what are we? What are you hearing there? What do you think about that? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Of course, sometimes you in a server you have the I don't know option, and that's a safe place to go. But what I like about um, Cattle's approach is that you were forcing respondents into committing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the never, be honest. I mean, the, I think the never option really got people to re, really be honest. Yeah, uh, essentially. Well, I mean, ten percent of them said when we asked how important is sustainability, not important at all. Ten percent, like they just. Don't care, uh, Colleen. Did you does that break down as we would would expect it by demographic? Uh, and is there any kind of observation around location? I mean, I think of Alberta as more freewheeling, more free spirited, uh, less constrained by how should I say? Uh, you know, the, the the what society thinks I should do. That's how I think about Albertans, right? They're just free spirit that way. Or it, it, did you detect any of that? It's, it's the younger generations are more concerned, but they're also the ones that can't afford. Right. Right. Mm. That's right. And, you know, urban are more concerned and aware, rural. Yeah. Yeah. It's less of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So Van, do you see that in, in other data that you look at this? Is this just a, you know, some of these results are somewhat conventional that the urban rural demographic split does this anything surprise you so not overly surprised uh, a few years ago actually with my team we looked into uh, environmental packaging and uh, mm. we did find out that uh, 
that packaging, eco-friendly packaging, uh, did not have a whole lot. Like people wanting wanted it, as long as it, it didn't cost more. So I think mm. I think people, again, results today that we're looking at uh, confirms the fact that people care about the environment, but they aren't necessarily willing to pay. It's like I've always believe it's like buying a new car with the seatbelt. You know. People mm-hmm. want the seat belt for safety, but are not willing to pay more for like a flashier seat belt. Seat belts will come yeah. with the car. When did you do that that research? A couple I, of years I ago. I think it was three years ago, uh, well, before the inflation yeah. uh, storm, obviously. So that's mm-hmm. why today's results are are pretty telling. I mean, I think people are, and of course, the other issue with uh, what's going on right now. Let's face it. I mean. The, the whole issue of environmental stewardship has been mm. politically um, has been Charged. politicized to yes. death with yeah. with the carbon oh. tax debate yeah, yeah. and everything else. So not to mention the carbon you know credits and all of this nonsense around you know huge companies going, hey, we're carbon neutral because we bought some credits. Yeah, exactly. Well, let, you know, can can we follow up on that point, Colleen? Because uh, uh, you did, I did see in the data, and you did tell us something about. What should we call it? Greenwashing. That consumers were very sensitive to that. What did the What did the survey tell us about that? I overall, like, th- there's a skeptic skepticism, mm. and it's you know that we're in an age of distrust and miscommunicate and misinformation, and you know the the primary reasons, you know, when we when we boil this data down, is that they're not buying sustainable products more frequently because it's priced higher and there's a lack of availability in some markets and the actual skepticism about the impact of these products. And if there was, you know, like when you look at the noise in the market about Loblaws and inflation and all the, 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 the shrinkflation and the Mm. scrimpflation, all of this, right. Mm -hmm. This is what they're hearing. And they're the, the, the trust that these big corporations are doing the right thing. It's just not there. Yeah, mm. no, absolutely. And that's why I, right now Parliament is, is is looking at Bill C-59 related to greenwashing. I mean, that's I, I think uh, when you have industry using language and uh, it is not reassuring the public, governments will tend to come in and intervene. And that's why we, ha- we have now Bill C-59. So, so there, there is a lot of distrust out there, unfortunately. And, uh, and at, at some point you, you got to clarify rules a little bit more. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, it, it's so interesting. I mean, at, at the end of the day, what, what I'm hearing between the two of you, I mean, Sylvain, you talked to years ago that people were still reluctant to pay a premium. Do we ever see a point and I mean, you do a lot of research for a lot of different companies. Do you ever see a point where people, uh, you know, say, listen, I, I this is something I'm going to pay for. It's part of our life, but I need some kind of assurance that it's real, right? Some kind of I don't know what that looks like, but do, does that sound like a something companies listening, the people, brand owners listening, should spend more time on? Actually, doing something real and meaningful is what's required. Mm. You know, is that the best thing for the shareholders of the company? I don't know. Oh, that's mm. interesting. What do you think of that, so far? Well, yeah, of, absolutely. Think I think uh, I think at some point, uh, companies, uh, food companies, will have to deliver the goods and make it real and authentic. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, and I'm sure Colleen knows of a few companies out there that are, you know, not helping. Mm. <laughs> They're mm. trying to uh, get ahead and uh, and. You're you're seeing you're hearing a lot of the carbon carbon neutral, net zero sort of lingo out there, and I do believe a lot of people will will remain skeptical for a while. So, uh, mm. and that's why it's important to talk about and and to understand the accounting behind all of the mm. work being done to decarbonize our 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 economy overall. I mean, on the positive side, we've had guests on like I think of uh, Vince Breton from Du Breton. You know, he, that's his forward-leaning position, right? The, the, the ethical, sustainable raising of, of, uh, of pork. And uh, I see him more often around. So, you know, maybe there's some signs of hope. One last question for me, and then I'll throw the mic back to Savannah to kind of wrap up. But, you know, the main factors – this is, this is interesting to me where you asked, what are the main factors uh, that stop you from buying sustainable products? 
the second response, 24%, was there's no difference in product quality. In other words, they were expecting more from a sustainable product? Is, or, or am I conflating that to being, hey, it's not sustainable, I don't believe it is? Do you, any, any thoughts on that? As you always say, we, we don't know what sometimes is behind the answers. But any, any thoughts on that, Colleen? If people are going to pay more, which a lot of these products are marginally more expensive and sometimes significantly more expensive, they want something for it other than the reward of doing the right thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, people will, we often say people uh, vote with their dollars, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to the environment. Uh, but I do think that things are maturing uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more. It, 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 being a, a good environmental steward will mean something different to different people. Like, work we we've, we've been talking about alberta and quebec and i actually do believe that both provinces very much care about the environment it's just i do believe that they're thinking about helping out and supporting the environment in different ways uh, and, and you know you've got a you've got a um an economy that you know is it has a foundation in life like many, many people with their livelihoods tied up in an in industry, which is not, is, is being attacked for being unsustainable, like from oil and, you know, mm. primary industries like that. So you've got a culture of people with a lot of mixed messaging coming out of it, which is, which is accurate based on what, which is reflected in the results here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was actually in Saskatchewan last week. And as you know, there's an election going on in the province and Scott Moe, the premier there has been anti-carbon tax like to death. Mm -hmm. And and to me, and when I was actually doing my keynote last week, I, I did say on stage that I, I'm quite concerned about the rhetoric because at the end of the day, people will associate carbon with bad, <laughs> not being yeah. a good thing to recognize. But I do believe that carbon markets and carbon credits and uh, I mean, Canada actually could have an advantage, could make carbon carbon markets an advantage for its agri-food sector. But right now, the rhetoric against the carbon tax is so strong that people are just turned off. They just, they just want to be as normal as possible and buy anything and everything. But at the end of the day, I do think that this, is, this agenda or this issue is not going to go away. No, especially with, you know, 63% of people saying the reason they don't buy it right. is because it's too expensive. Exactly. And how do you unwind that? Exactly. All, we're a long way from the upside of that, even if, you know, the economy starts to turn around. We're a long way from that. So let, shout out to all the brand owners out there. There's some clear messaging from this uh, survey. Absolutely. Thank, it's clear messaging. Uh, so if you hadn't seen it before, you have now. Thanks to Colleen and Cattle. <laughs> Great research, uh, you know, with a vast amount of responses. So, Are you uh, satisfied now, Michael? Are you satisfied? <laughs> I'm satisfied. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm all. I, we ask these questions of Colleen because we know we're going to get super interesting and very insightful answers. So, yep. um, once again, Colleen delivers the goods. Well, thanks so much for joining <laughs> us. On, You're welcome. Uh, on we will make pod, this Colleen. available on your site and Fantastic. our site. So, anyone wants to dig into the data, they're more than welcome. Excellent. All right. Thanks, thanks Colleen, again for joining us. Yep. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. Let's come back for the last couple of things. Uh, well, new news happened uh, yesterday. Uh, the Bank of Canada did a uh, 500 basis point reduction. What did it take the the rate down to 3.75? Um, any any thoughts uh, on the uh, impacts on the ag sector? It feels like uh, you know they, there's some opportunity for more investment, perhaps, or more innovation. What what are your thoughts on the uh, reduction of the interest rate of this order of magnitude? Well, I mean, we were just talking about cattle uh, a few minutes ago. That's but actually cattle help with us. a T, not cattle with a D. Of course, cattle with two T's. That's right, and uh, but I do think that cash flow is a big deal in cattle, and that that may actually get people to reinvest because with higher interest rates, it, it really is. Because when you actually hold inventory for like two years, it's you gotta you gotta move your products, and uh, so with 0.5, that's starting to be very interesting. Of course, with capital investments, also very interesting as well. Uh, for consumers, uh, I think everyone needed the cut, um, a cu uh, like a, a 0.5 point cut is, I mean, it's not a good indication for the economy. I mean, it means that the economy is not doing well. The little incremental cuts weren't enough to knock us out of this malaise. We need a bigger statement faster. Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. What do you think? But I, th but I think that, I mean, 
honestly, I, I'm concerned about the real estate market, uh, that uh, it's going to get hot again. And uh, that's the last thing we want, we need right well, we now. Need, we, need, mean, we need about a million and a half houses. So something yeah. needs to happen, right? Yeah, exactly. So will that will that actually get people to invest more in real estate and build more houses? Let's hope probably or apartments. Let's hope it. Build, anyway, and yeah. we're not an economics but anyways, podcast either. But anyway, we play yeah, one but, on television. But still, right? I mean, I, I do. housing. What well, the thing we learned the last year and a half or so is that housing costs do impact how people spend money on food. So yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. why we have, we were, we're paying attention. Uh, to, to interest rates. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that uh, Canada's economy is not great. My biggest concern moving forward is the Canadian dollar, of course. Okay. But when you look at the CPI, and we talked about it last week, most components that are keeping our food inflation lower are imported components. And if, if the Canadian dollar lowers against the greenback, well, that's not necessarily good news because imports are helping us right now. So hopefully... Canadian dollar will remain, but it did it did uh, get lower. It was it lowered today compared to the American dollar. But I didn't actually I didn't look at the percentage. I got homework assignment for you, Professor. Really? I want you to watch, and I'll send you a link to the preview. Uh, new documentary, A World Without Cows. We're I've coming, heard about it. Yeah, we're coming full circle here. We started with uh, the bovines, we're ending with them, and the, and the, uh, the in the in this in the um, in the preview to the documentary, it says, listen, we're thinking about this all wrong. Cows have a very important role to play in the ecology globally. And I think it could be eye-opening, but I want your opinion. So let's go both watch A World Without Cows. I'll put a link into the preview in the show notes and see what we can make of it. And you've heard of it, right? Have you heard good things, bad things, or you've just heard of it? I just heard about it, yeah. But it reminds me, and I will look. I will look into it. It reminds me that this weekend I'll be busy at Devour. Devour mm. is the international food film festival in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Our lab is a sponsor, uh, mm. and we'll be presenting a couple of documentaries. We actually are uh, hosting a couple of uh, of uh, shows. The first one is Send Kelp. It's a uh, seaweed nerd <laughs> like by that. the name of uh, Francis Ward, who I will be meeting, actually, in Wolfville tomorrow. Uh, explores the whole world of seaweed. It's a documentary out of BC and uh, also uh, will be uh, showing Woman Captain uh, on Saturday. And Woman Captain is a story of a woman who's captain of a vessel and she uh, she lobster fish as a woman, and uh, it's a great God documentary. And very proud to be part of Devour in Woolville. So if you're ever in the Nova Scotia after Halifax, you should go to Woolville because they re- it's a really really cute town. All right. Well, I'll put a if you give me a link, I'll put a link just in case you happen to be there. And I've been to Woolville. It's a lovely town, lovely place, uh, yeah. great part of uh, great part of this great nation. So listen, that's a, that's a wrap on this episode. Uh, thanks for joining us. We got an exciting, I'm not going to talk about it on this episode. We got an exciting guest coming up, as we always do. We got a bunch of exciting guests coming up, but we got a really interesting one. Uh, it's next week, isn't it? Next week, but we're not going to say who. Next week. And uh, we're going to leave that hanging right there. Until hanging. then, hanging. Uh, until then. It's not Santa Claus, is it? It no. is not Santa Claus. It is not Halloween based. Uh, okay. It is, uh, but anyway, uh, let's just leave it there. I'm Michael LeBlanc consumer growth advisor keynote speaker media entrepreneur and a bunch of other things and you are i'm the food professor sylvain chalabois all right safe travels everybody take care